Welcome. We're here for chapter four of Barry Cohen's Explaining Psychological Statistics. This chapter, we're going to learn about standardizing, distributions, density plots, the normal curve, central limit theorem, law of large numbers, a lot of good stuff. So this chapter is a lot of what we would do with pencil and paper with undergrad stats. So we will be doing a, some hand calculations. The good news is we're using the Z table instead of calculus and you will have that on your test. It's in the appendix of our book and you can use a calculator. And the hardest math is add, subtract. There might be a multiply and divide, but it's mostly add and subtract. So should, should be able to get through it. The reason we're doing this is because the foundation here is p-values and every statistical technique that we are learning in this class uses a p-value to decide if something is statistically significant. And so we need to understand where that concept's coming from. So here we go. We are going to, re I'm going to, re you should always plot your data. Plot your data, data. Um, decide what the shape of the histogram or box plot is. Are there outliers? What's the center? What's the spread? That could be mean and standard deviation if it's a symmetrical distribution or median in interquartile range if it is a skewed distribution. Sometimes though our data has such a smooth overlying pattern that we can describe it with a um, distribution, a density curve. So we're going to watch this video because it says it a lot better than I could. In this video, we will be learning about density curves and the properties of density curves. But before we talk about this, we have to do a bit of review. Let's say we have a room of 20 people, and we record each of their weights. Then, we take this information and create a histogram. Recall with any histogram, we can transform a regular frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution. The only difference between these two is that a regular frequency distribution tells us the number of people within a given interval, whereas a relative frequency distribution tells us the proportion or percentage of data values within that same interval. For example, there are 6 people that weigh between 100 and 110 pounds, but we can also say that 30% of the people in our data set weigh between 100 and 110 pounds. To convert a frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution, we first needed to know the total number of individuals we were working with. In this example, we are working with a total of 20 people. Next, we needed to determine the proportion of individuals in each interval. We did that by dividing the number of people in each interval by the total amount of people. This gave us our relative frequency values. Now you know that you have done this entire conversion process correctly if you add up the relative frequencies of each interval and they add up to 1. The total area of any frequency distribution is always equal to 1 or 100%. So what is a density curve anyways, and where does it come from? A density curve is just the curve that helps us visualize the overall shape of a distribution. If we take the histogram we just worked with, and if we draw a curve around its distribution, we have essentially made a density curve. This can be done with any type of histogram, with any shape, and with any form. And like a relative frequency distribution, density curves always have an area that is equal to 1 or 100%. Now you might be wondering, what's the point of a density curve anyways? Why don't we just stick to using histograms? Good question. Well, density curves have a few advantages over histograms. First of all, Density curves give us an idealized picture of a population or data set without considering irregularities and outliers. Because of this, it really gives us a great overall picture of the actual distribution and its tendencies. Secondly, the picture of a histogram really depends on how many intervals you have. The more intervals you have, the better you can see the distribution of the data. Remember, but with a density curve, you are not limited by the number of intervals there are, and you can actually have an infinite amount of intervals. And third, a smooth curve is generally easier to work with than a histogram, especially when you are working with very large populations. Now the use of density curves becomes more practical the larger your population is. If we made a histogram from data we collected from 50 people and drew a density curve over it, we have a lot of missing gaps. And because of that, our density curve can be inaccurate. Now imagine if we had a population of 100,000 people instead of 50. 
Because our population is so big, we can continuously reduce the length of each interval we have until we end up with so many intervals that we essentially end up with a histogram that can be accurately represented by a density curve. This is why density curves are so valuable. They aren't limited by these intervals, and they can be very useful when working with very large populations. We can also use density curves to make approximations. For example, if we have a density curve that represented the test scores of 1 million people, by looking at the curve, we can say that half of the people scored over 60 on this test. We can also say that a large majority of students score between 50 and 70 because there's a lot of area contained within this region. We can also say that only a few students did very well on this test because there's only a small amount of area contained within the upper tail region of the curve. You'll know how to calculate these exact areas in an upcoming video. But now that you know what a density curve is, we have to go over some very important rules for having a valid density curve. In other words, we'll have to talk about the properties of a density curve. These are the first rule is that a density curve must lie on or above the horizontal axis. Density curves that are drawn along the y-axis or ones that dip below the x-axis are invalid. A density curve has to sit on the x-axis in order to be valid. The second rule is that the total area under the curve is always equal to 1. Now if I said that the total area was equal to 5, 12, 70, or any number other than 1, then I do not have a valid density curve. However, if I said that the total area was equal to 1 or 100%, then I do have a valid density curve. This is a very important fact and it's one worth remembering. Density curves come in many different shapes and sizes. Some are well known mathematically and others aren't. Each type of density curve has its own name. A common density curve you might encounter is the uniform distribution. It is called this because each interval has the same frequency of data values and is uniform throughout the entire data set. We also have the triangular distribution, and it's called this because, well, it looks like a triangle. And most importantly, we have the normal distribution, also known as the bell curve. In For statistics, curve. this is the most important density curve that you should familiarize yourself with. We'll be talking a lot about this curve in the upcoming videos, but for now, it's very important that you understand the concept of density curves. So let's do some practice questions. Feel free to pause the video at any point so you can try these questions for yourself. Question number one. For the density curve below, approximately what percentage of people weigh exactly 150 pounds? Think about it, what do you think? A common mistake that students make in these types of questions is they see 150 on the graph. They draw a line and then they see that it lines up with 0.20. So they will say that the answer is 20%. Now this is incorrect. Remember that the total area of a density curve is always equal to 100%. This line definitely does not have an area of 20%. In fact, the area of this line is equal to zero because a line has no width. As a result, the answer is equal to zero. Logically, this makes sense because realistically, no one will ever weigh exactly 150.000 pounds. Usually, you'll have some measurements very close to it, like 150.5, 150.70, 150.05, and so on and so forth. However, if I asked you what percentage of people weigh between 150 and 152 pounds, then we have this entire area to account for. We can actually get a rough estimate of this area. We know that the area of a rectangle is equal to the length times the width. We have a length of 0.15 and a width of 2. Multiplying these together gives us an answer of 0.30. However, we still have this top portion to account for. To estimate this area, we see that it is almost equal to half of a square. The area of a square is equal to its length times its width, which is equal to 0.05 times 2, which gives us 0.1 and half of 0.1 is equal to 0.05. Therefore, the total area is roughly equal to 0.05 plus 0.30, which is equal to 0.35. As a result, the percentage of people that weigh between 150 and 152 pounds is roughly equal to 35%. As I mentioned before, you'll know how to calculate these exact areas in an upcoming video. Okay, I'm gonna stop this one here. This is what we're gonna use our table, our Z table, to calculate exactly. But I thought it was interesting to show how you can estimate these probabilities with rectangles and triangles. 
So to review, a density curve has some properties. It's always on or above the horizontal axis, not the vertical axis, not below, and the total area underneath it is exactly one. So we can look at probabilities under the curve. Now, just like the video said, there are lots and lots of distributions, some that have mathematical properties and equations and some that are normal. But I want to bring up that normal is not the same as good. There are lots of distributions that are not normal that are completely valid. And so here I have some examples and we could think of these as maybe college or high school seniors in Utah. And the first plot is the heights. That look, histogram looks roughly normal. It has a normal curve in red drawn over the top. Most heights of biological populations, whether it's animals, minerals, vegetables, people, mammals, usually follow a normal curve. It's very common in the real world. However, not everything is normal. This middle plot shows GPA of those high school seniors in Utah. And you can see that this is definitely not following that red normal curve that is drawn over the top of the histogram. It looks like the bulk of students are having GPAs between three and four. It's almost somewhat uniform between three and four. And then we have another mode or peak that is somewhere around two and a half, 2.7 ish range. So this is a bimodal distribution or a non um, simple distribution. It's definitely not normal, but it is meaningful. This last distribution that's shown is number of tattoos. Well, seniors in high school, the bulk the majority, the greater point percentage are going to have no tattoos. So you see the bar that's at zero is the tallest by far. And then each bar after goes down with a trickling little tail out to a single person at 12. This again is a valid distribution. There's nothing wrong with it. It is just showing the values in this sample and it may or may not be normal. So here is a, another set of histograms and it's constantly changing through different samples. This is Australian males. So if we took a sample of Australian males and we made a histogram and we did that repeatedly, you can see that each histogram is not normal. But overall, all the samples are roughly normal. And so normal is usually referring to the whole population, even though particular samples will be more or less roughly normal. So in this slide, on um, moving from left to right, the first picture is the histogram. The middle one has the density normal curve drawn over the top, and the last one is that density curve alone. And you can see that they are not a perfect match, but we can theorize that even though our sample has this rough outline, if we were to take the entire population, if that was possible, we would probably see it being more smoothed out for the whole population. So this normal curve is important because this bell curve shape shows up in a lot of different places naturally occurring. However, a more important thing about the normal curve is not so much that a particular set of data follows the normal curve, but the idea of when we do the sample average, the sample mean, the mean will follow the normal distribution. And this is the assumption for correlations, regressions, t-tests, ANOVA, all of these things that we're going to learn in this class, every single method. And I just want to throw out that another name for this normal curve is the Gaussian curve because it was established and first published on by a man named Carl Gauss. So a Gaussian curve is a normal curve, is a bell curve. So we are going to go over the shiny apps, the interactive ones on the websites in class. So I'll skip that for now. If we have data that does follow a normal curve, we can use the normal curve to answer some questions. We know that under the whole curve is 100% or all, in this case, Australian men's heights. We can ask questions about what's the middle 50%? How tall are they? How tall are, do you have to be to be in the top 20%? How tall are people within one standard deviation of the average, within two standard deviations, within three standard deviations. And you'll see that each of these curves has a different area underneath it shaded. 
And as we work these pencil and paper hand calculations, it's going to be very important that we draw, to the best of our ability, it's not an art class, a normal curve and shade the region that we are trying to put a number on. So we have another quick little video, and these will be linked in the YouTube notes. In this video, we'll be learning about the normal distribution and the 68-95-99.7 rule. When we talk about normal distributions, we refer to data we get from a population or sample. So before we actually talk about the normal distribution, we need to first distinguish the difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter is a number that describes the data from a population, whereas a statistic is a number that describes the data from a sample. Examples of parameters and statistics are the mean and standard deviation, but because of the definitions we just talked about, we have to be very careful with what symbols we use to represent these numbers. When we are dealing with a sample, we use the symbol x bar to represent the sample mean, and we use the letter s to represent the sample standard deviation. These are statistics. When we are dealing with a population, we use the Greek letter mu to represent the population mean, and we use the Greek letter sigma to represent the population standard deviation. These are parameters. The population parameters mu and sigma are very important when we talk about normally distributed populations. So what is a normal distribution anyways? A normal distribution is a special type of density curve that is bell-shaped. For this reason, the normal distribution is sometimes called the bell curve or the normal curve. Or Gaussian. The normal distribution describes the tendency for data to cluster around a central value. In fact, this central value is the population mean mu, which is always located in the middle of the curve. So for any normal distribution, we can say that some data points will fall below the mean, other data points will fall above the mean, but most of the data values are located near the mean. The normal distribution and its shape actually arises from many different variables found in nature, such as weight, height, volume, blood pressure, and many more. Common. This is why the normal distribution is commonly studied. For example, exam scores are known to follow a normal distribution. In some people do class. great on exams, some people do poorly on exams, Not but a class. large majority of people score near the average or the mean. In this example, the average exam score is 50 because it is located in the middle of the curve. Now that you know what a normal distribution looks like, we need to talk about the population mean mu and the population standard deviation sigma. Both of these tell us important information about how the normal distribution looks. We'll talk about the population mean mu first. The population mean mu characterizes the position of the normal distribution. If you increase the mean, the curve will follow and move towards the right. And if you decrease the mean, the curve will still follow and move towards the left. This happens because the data will always cluster around the mean in normally distributed populations. As a result, the value of the mean determines the position of the normal distribution. On the other hand, the population standard deviation sigma characterizes the spread of the normal distribution. The larger the standard deviation, the more spread out the distribution will be. And the smaller the standard deviation, the less spread out it will be. Notice that when the spread increases, the curve gets much flatter, and when the spread decreases, the curve gets taller. The reason for this is because the normal distribution is a density curve, and the total area of any density curve must remain equal to 1 or 100%. So changes in the width of the curve must be compensated for by changes in the height of the curve, and vice versa. Overall, here are some points about the normal distribution. The normal distribution is unimodal. This means that the distribution has a single peak. The normal curve is symmetric about its mean, so you can clearly see that the distribution can be cut into two equal halves. The parameters mu and sigma completely characterize the normal distribution. The population mean mu determines the location of the distribution and where the data tends to cluster around. The population standard deviation sigma determines how spread out the distribution will be. The notation given to a population that follows a normal distribution we can be written like it. this. Although it looks scary, it means what it says. For the variable x, it follows a normal distribution and has the mean mu with a standard deviation of sigma. 
Now that you've been introduced to the normal distribution, we can talk about the 6895 99.7 rule. Very important. If we were measuring the heights of all students at a local university and found that it was normally distributed with a mean height of 5.5 feet and a standard deviation of half a foot or 0.5, we can construct a normal distribution as follows. From here, we can create intervals that increase by the standard deviation. So we'll have 6, 6.5, and 7, and on the other side, we'll have 5, 4.5, and 4. So what the 6895 99.7 rule says is that, within one standard deviation away from the mean, it contains a total area of 0.68 or 68%. Because of this, we can say that 68% of the population are between 5 and 6 feet tall. And if you go two standard deviations away from the mean, it contains an area of 95%. This means that 95% of the people in the population have a height between 4.5 and 6.5 feet. And finally, within three standard deviations away from the mean, it contains a total area of 99.7%. This means that, for the population we are studying, 99.7% of the people are between 4 and 7 feet tall. Now you might be wondering, what happens if we go four standard deviations away from the mean, or five or six standard deviations away from the mean? And to answer that, you actually can. A normal distribution actually never touches the x-axis. It continues on to infinity. So you can go as many standard deviations away from the mean as you want, but the area contained within these regions will be very, very small. The 6895 99.7 rule is a great way for approximating the areas of a normal distribution. And this works for any normal distribution, no matter what shape and size. So let's do some practice questions. Feel free to pause the video at any point so you can try these questions for yourself. Question number one. The normal distribution below has a standard deviation of 10. Approximately what area is contained between 70 and 90? In this question, we know that the population mean is equal to 70 because it's in the center of the distribution. We also know from the question that one standard deviation is equal to 10, and we can see this because each interval goes up by 10. According to the 6895 99.7 rule, we know that there is an area of 95% contained within two standard deviations of the mean. Two standard deviations to the right gets us to 90, and two standard deviations to the left gets us to 50. According to the 6895 99.7 rule, this means that there is an area of 95% contained within this interval. However, we are only interested in the area from 70 to 90. So dividing this area by 2 gives us our area of interest. 95% divided by 2 gives us an area of 47.5%, and that is our answer. Question number 2. For the normal distribution below, approximately what area is contained between negative 2 and 1? Okay, I want to point out that this normal distribution is the standard normal distribution because its center is exactly 0 and its standard deviation is exactly 1. So I just want to point that out. In this example, we know that we have a mu of 0 because 0 is in the center of the distribution, and we know that we have a sigma of 1 because each interval goes up by 1. To approximate the area between negative 2 and 1, we will use the 6895 99.7 rule. We can strategically divide this area into two parts so that we can easily incorporate this rule. We'll start with the right half, which goes from 0 to 1. We know that one standard deviation away from the mean gives us 68% and half of this is 34%, giving us our area from 0 to 1. The next half goes from 0 to negative 2, but we know that within two standard deviations from the mean, we have an area of 95%. Dividing this by 2 gives us the area from 0 to negative 2, which is equal to 47.5%. And finally, to get the total area contained between negative 2 and 1, all we have to do is add these two areas together, and when we do, we get a total area of 81.5%. If you found this video helpful, consider supporting us on Patreon to help us make more. This is a great website, or, or YouTube channel. They do such great work. I love it. So I want to review. This is something that you'll want to have a note for, for the test, and to have on hand for working homework problems. And it's a good thing, this is one of the things that might be helpful to understand and memorize to that point. So within one standard deviation on either side of the mean, the normal curve will incorporate 
68% of your data. And if you go out to two standard deviations, you capture 95%. And if you go out to three standard deviations, you capture almost all, 99.7%. So this lovely formula is the formula for the Gaussian or normal curve. And you do not need to memorize it, but the way that we find the areas under the curve is to do calculus integration with that formula. But because you know, that's something that not everyone wants to break out in the middle of the day, especially for that nasty formula, these tables in the back of the book have been created to not have to do that by hand every single time we want to make a um, do a problem. So like the video said, you can have any number for the mean and a po any positive number for the standard deviation. And together, they place the normal bell curve center and spread. But if we standardize, which is the next thing we're going to learn how to do, it will convert any normal curve to the standard normal curve, which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we can use those tables in our book. So the table that we have is set up like this, and we'll use it on some example problems. On this slide, you can download it here. I'll also link it on the Canvas page, as well as it's on our class website. So. The next thing you might be asking, how do we know if we have a normal distribution? And the number one way is to plot it. And so far we've learned how to plot histograms. And then coming up in the next chapter or two, we'll learn how to make these QQ or normal quantile plots. And if it's a normal distribution, the points are on a line. So that's how we'll know. So standardizing, this is how we convert any scores to a Z score or a Z score. You'll hear it pronounced both ways. It's this two step process. First, we subtract the mean, that's the population mean, and then we divide by the standard deviation. That's a population standard deviation. Now, if both of those things are unknown, we can use the sample value. So you'll see the formulas on this slide. We have two forms, both of them take X, a known quantity in whatever units we have, whether that's degrees or feet or depression points, we're going to subtract the average, whichever one we have, and divide by the standard deviation. In these plots, the top green one, this is original units. This is IQ points for a group of high school students. And you'll see it's roughly, really roughly normal, but we have a peak or a mode or a mean and median that's going to be a little above 100. If I was to take that list of numbers and standardize them by taking each number, subtracting the average, dividing by the standard deviation, we would end up with the bottom plot in blue. And this is the standardized scores. So there is a different center. The center is now zero and the units have changed from IQ points. And now they are in terms of standard deviations. The standard normal curve has units of standard deviations. And um, so that's an important thing, but I want you to check out the shape. When we standardize, we do not change the shape. Standardizing changes the units. It does not make the data normal. Standardizing is not normalizing. And this is something that a lot of even professors sometimes get confused on. So we're going to do a couple examples and wrap up this recording. So all of these, and we're going to do, I think, five examples here. They're multi-part problems, and I have already put on the slides all the, the numbers so I don't have to write and, and take that time so this can go faster. So this first slide says we know that 95% of students at a particular school are between 1.1 and 1.7 meters tall. A meter tall, that's three feet. So these are between three and four feet. I bet this is an elementary school. So here's a big assumption. We're going to assume that the heights here follow the normal distribution, which is actually a fair one because most heights in most populations do. So from the information given, we are going to calculate the mean and the standard deviation for this particular normal distribution. Now we've only been given two pieces of information. We've been given 95% and the numbers it's between. So there are some things about the normal distribution that we can leverage to figure this out. And one thing we know about the normal distribution is it's symmetrical and it's always centered around the mean. 
So we are told 95% of students are between these numbers. And so the mean value has to be completely between. If the mean is in the middle, then we can average these two extremes, ends, the 1.1 and the 1.7, and figure out that our mean must be 1.4 because that's halfway in between the range uh, going from 1.1 to 1.7. So that's an important part of the normal curve. It's completely symmetric, centered at the mean. The second piece of information we're given here is 95%. And this harkens back to that rule that if we go from the mean out to standard deviations in either direction, the center will contain 95%. So because we're told we have 95%, we know that these ends of the range are the mean plus two standard deviations and the mean minus two standard deviation. So if we look at this, that's covering four standard deviations total from one number to the other. So if we subtract these two numbers to get the range, we can dice it in by dividing by four to get how much each standard deviation is. So this population, which we're gonna do some more questions on and some more examples, remember, now we know it has a mean of 1.4 and a standard deviation spread of 0.15. Again, sometimes, I would say all the time, drawing and shading these normal curves on your paper will help you figure these out. Even after teaching this material for 20 years, I still draw a normal curve. Okay, so we're gonna move on with example number two. We're working with the same population and say you have a friend a younger friend who is going to the school and their height is 1.5 meters. How far away are they from the average, the mean? And we can answer that question in terms of meters of height as well as number of standard deviations. So meters is pretty easy. The average we just determined was 1.4 and they're taller than that, they're 1.85. We can find out how much taller by subtracting and they're mm, just a little less than half a meter above average. And this, since we've subtracted meters from meters, this difference is in meters. Now we want to know in terms of standard deviation. Remember, standardizing had two parts. Not only do we subtract the average, but after that we divide by the standard deviation. So we can find out how many standard deviations above normal this tall person is by doing that two-step process. We can take their height of one point eight five meters, subtract the average of 1.4 meters and divide by the standard deviations. And this person, it turns out, is three, exactly three standard deviations above average. And that pretty tall because we know if we go up three standard deviations and down three standard deviations from the center, from the mean, that would account for nearly the entire population. So this person is quite tall for this population. So we can find out exactly how many people are taller than them or shorter than them using the Z tables. And this is the one that is in our book. So let's do another set of examples. This is gonna be example three that has us have to pull out this Z table and I can go over how we're gonna use it. So this is a four part question for number three. Again, we're working with that same population of students at a school that is normally distributed with mean 1.4 meters and standard deviation of 0.15 meters. So we're gonna start out with, we want to find the Z score and we know how many meters tall the student is. For this, we can do our two step standardizing process. We can take our known height, and that's our x value, 1.63 meters, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and we can find out how many standard deviations above normal they are. In this case, just over one and a half standard deviations above normal. Above because it's positive and the height is above average. We can go the reverse direction as well. If we have a z-score, we can figure out how tall that student was. Now we can plug in the numbers we know into this formula in the red box and work backwards to solve for x, or this formula can be solved for x first. And this would be something that you would want to have probably on your notes for the exam and while you're working on the homework. So in this number two, we want to find the height x and we know the mean, the standard deviation, and we are told the z-score. So we can plug those number in the formula 
multiply the z-score and standard deviation, add it to the mean, and find out that they're 1.59 meters tall. So the z-score, if we know the mean and standard deviation, can help us convert both directions between z-scores or z-scores and actual units of observation, which is meters in this case. All right, now comes the part where we're going to have to use the z-table. Percentile rank and percentiles. Remember, percentile ranks and percentiles refer to the percentage that are that or less. So number three, we're going to work with a person that's 1.51 meters tall. So we know they're above average. So I'm going to mark them on my normal curve. Remember, the normal curve is always centered on the population average. That's engraven in the brain. Population average is the center of the curve. So if the center is 1.4, this person is above average. Now we need to convert their height in meters, which is an X score, into a Z or Z score using that formula in the red box. This person is less than a standard deviation above normal. Now when you're working these problems, I want you to use up to four decimal places. Always four if there are four different numbers. If it only has two numbers after the decimal point, just use those two. But if it's a number that keeps going anytime you divide, use four numbers after the decimal place until you get to your final answer, which you should report with two decimal places for now, until we get to p-values. So this is where we need our book's z-table. We have converted our height to z-table. 0.87. We need to use this information to find out about the area under the curve. This is the point in that last video that they use rectangles and triangles. Well, we're going to do it with the table that was built off the calculus of that nasty formula. So before I go to my table, I'm going to shade my curve. Now, if we want percentile rank, that's from our value and less. So outlined in red here is the percentile rank. It's more than half. Because we know the normal curve, again, it's centered on the mean, and the total area is 1. Since it's symmetrical, each half will be an area of 0.5. So the lighter blue side here is exactly half the curve. Its area is going to be 0.5. So what we need to find is the darker tealish blue area that is mm, a kind of strip there in the middle. And that is called a mean to z area. There's two different kind of areas we can look up in the table. We can look at a mean to z, which is highlighted in green here, or beyond z, which is the purple. So for all, this case, we had a z-score, and we're going to look. Now, this is just a snippet of that table. We're going to look where it says z, and we're going to go down the column. It's going to be a couple of pages until we find our z-score. Now, our z-score was 0.87. So we're going to scan down the column to find 0.87. And then as we look across that column, we can find out both the mean to z or the beyond z. In this case, we want the mean to z so that we can fill in that teal strip, which I'm labeling here. And then we know the light blue side is exactly half the curve, so it's 0.5. So in this case, to get the percentile rank, I'm going to have to add half of the curve to the strip we just looked up in the table based on the z-score. In this case, together, we get a number, again, with four decimal places, 0.8079. When we make percentile ranks, we usually report them as a percentile rank whole number. So I would round this to the 81st percentile rank. So here, we've been given a height, and we had to convert to percentile rank. In our last part of this example, we were going to be given a percentile and having to work backwards to the height. So in this case, I'm going to shade my curve first because the key, first key point of information we're given is 90th percentile. 90th percentile means 90% are going to be shorter and only 10% are going to be higher. So this person is going to be on the high end of height. They're a tall person. When I shade my curve, I want to make sure I'm shading 90% of the area under the curve from a height that we don't know, but to the left. Again, that's going to be more than half of the curve. So in hot pink, I've labeled 0.5 for half the curve. Now we need to find this little light um, lavender chunk. And it, to be 90%, 0.5 has got to be added to 0.4. I'll put some decimals on here because the areas are listed to four decimal places in the Z table. So again, 
if we're in the 90th percentile, only 10% is on this higher end of taller heights. This is where we can go to the Z table. Again, the Z table has two listings. It has from mean to Z or Z beyond, and they're side by side. So let's go back to our table. And so we are going to look, the mean to Z should be 0.4 exactly, and the beyond Z should be 0.1 exactly. Now in this table, it only does Z scores out to two decimal places, which is fine for our purposes. In the real world, we let the computer do all the calculus for us and give us 10 decimal places. In our class, just go with the number, the row that's closest to the thing that you're looking for. So we went 0.10 to be in the beyond Z tail, and we want 0.40 to be in the mean to Z strip. The closest one out of these two is a Z score of 1.28. So we're gonna go with that, close enough. So now that we have a Z score from our, a, our table A1, we need to use that Z score to go back to height, which we're using X to represent it. And so we can use that revised, re-massaged formula to know that now we found out that to be in the 90th percentile, they need a Z score of 1.28. Remember what a Z score is? 1.28 standard deviations above normal, so or above the mean. So we're gonna take the mean value and add 1.28 times the standard deviation. And when we do the uh, multiplying and the adding, we find out that this person or any person in this class to be in the 90th percentile of height, they need to be 1.59 meters or taller. Okay, just two more examples and we'll cut off this recording. <coughs> Now we're going to find probabilities, and this is working closer to getting to those p-values that we need to do our statistical tests. We're going to continue on, same population of students, same mean and standard deviation and normal curve. Now I want to calculate probabilities, and the three that I want to calculate here is what is the probability or chance that any student is more than 1.63 meters tall, number two, less than 1.2 meters tall, or somewhere between those two heights. So all of these three deal with the same population. Remember, the population, if it's normal, is always centered at the mean. So I've labeled these curves, I've drawn a blue dashed line in the middle, right down the center of each of these normal curves, and I've labeled them all with the population average that we've been provided, 1.4 meters. And I've labeled this X, and the units are meters, or M. Underneath that, I've drawn another set of axes, and these I've labeled Z, and Z is in terms of standard deviations. Now, the, when we do the Z-score formula with this red formula on the box, Z equals X minus mu over sigma, we convert from any normal distribution to the standard normal distribution. The difference being, instead of having a number for the center, our center, when we do a Z-score, is zero. So now let me find the z-score for these two different heights. Plug in our mean and standard deviation, plug in each of our heights. For number one, our z-score is 1.53. For number two, we've gotten a negative z-score, negative 1.33. So I'm gonna go ahead and label and shade my curves. So for the first one, I'm gonna label a height of 1.63 meters, which translates into a z-score of 1.53 meters. And we're being asked to find the chance or the probability that someone is more than that much tall. So I shaded it in red and reminded myself with a little note that I want to find that upper little tail, the beyond z part. For number two, we wanna find people um, the probability that someone is shorter than or less than 1.2 meters tall. So I'm gonna label my one, two, 0.2 meters tall on my first axis, and below that, the converted Z score, or Z score of negative 1.33. And I'm shading the less than heights this time and reminding myself that's what I wanna find. And then this last third option, we wanna find the area between these two heights. So they're the same heights, so they have the same Z scores we've already calculated. So, 
For number one, we want to find the above z, where z is 1.53. But number two is a little bit tricky because our z-score turned out to be negative. Well, our table in here only has positive z values, but that's okay because we know the normal curve is symmetrical. So both sides are going to be mirror images of each other. So we can look up the positive z-score or the negative without having a negative z-score and we'll get the same information. It's just going the other direction. So back to our table. We're going to be looking for our z-scores of 1.53 and 1.33. So again, this is just a snippet of the table. So if we go to a z-score of 1.33, we can see that our beyond z table, oh wait, 1.53, that's the beyond z, that's a tail of 0 0.6030. And the 1.33 that was negative, we're just going to look it up as if it was positive, and we can still find the tail or the beyond z. Remember, its tails are beyond z, and the strips in the middle are mean to z. It's always helpful to look at the little sketch at the top of the table. So if I label those here, I know that for being above 1.63 meters tall, I use the beyond z. That probability is 0 0.0630, if I'm going to report all four decimal places. For the second one, less than 1.2 meters tall, our tail value is 0 0.0918. To do the last one, we have to put, cobble together two center strips. I've done them in different colors because I uh, it helped me keep track of them. So in this case, you've got to add those two areas together to get the total center section. And so we can find out that in this population, to be between 1.2 and 1.63 meters tall, that would include almost 85% of the population. Okay, are we good for one more? This is it. We're going to go back to the percentiles. This time, we're going to find a percentile rank from a height, and then we'll go back the other way. So for this first problem, uh, we have a height of 1.7 meters tall. So again, I'm always going to take my normal curve, I'm going to label right under it in meters, that's x variable, and below that I'm going to label in terms of z, that standardized score, in terms of standard deviations. The center of the curve is the population when you're doing an x or the original units. For the z-score, the center is always zero. It's always best if you label these first before you start doing any math. Now, for the first part of this question, we want percentile rank, that's from that score below. So this person is 1.7 meters tall. So I'm gonna now mark on my curve 1.7 meters tall. And that's how many meters tall they are, but now I need to convert it to a z-score. So I'm going to plug that into my z-score formula, taking the 1.7 meters tall, subtracting the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and getting the z-score. This z-score is 2.0. Now, to do the percentile rank, I need from there below, which includes the majority of this curve. So it's going to be a pretty big number compared to 1. And I've shaded from the 1.7 below. And this incorporates a center chunk as well as a whole half. It's really nice if you can get a whole half because you know half of the curve is 0.5. Now we need to go to the table to get that mean to z-score strip by looking up our z-score of 2.0. So going into our z-table, here's another snippet. We're going to look under z for 2.0. And as we go across, in the green highlighted column first, we run into that's the center strip from the mean over to z, and we see it's 0.44772. So that's the middle strip. Now to get to the percentile, having the shaded really helps. We can, I, I can see that my answer is not just that middle strip. It's from 1.7 meters, or 2 z-score, all the way down to negative infinity. So I'm going to add my 0.4772 to a half to get my total percentile rank, which would be as a decimal point, 9772. Again, percentile rank, we're going to mark as a whole number, the 98th percentile. Whew, so that was going from a height to a percentile rank. Now we're going to go in the reverse. We are given a percentile rank. Now remember, what's the de definition of a percentile rank? 
it's from there or less. So I'm going to go ahead and shade my curve. Now, since it's the 15th percentile, that's less than half. So that's going to put us on the lower end because if it was more than a half, it would be on the upper side of our curve. So if I shade my curve, I know the area from our unknown height down to shorter people is going to be 15% or 0.15. So that's the beyond Z area I need to look up in my table. So I go to my table and I'm looking for a beyond Z area of 0.15 even. But that value isn't there. So again, in this class, we're not going to interpolate. We're just going to go with the closest one that we have in our table and follow it across to get our z-score. In this case, our z-score that's closest is 1.04. Now, I think I've set up the homework assignment that if you were to use 1.03, the answer would be accepted still. But it, we'll just go with the, the closest one. Now, that process of using the table helps us convert between z-scores and areas. The formula for z-score helps us convert from z-scores to heights or heights to z-score. And we can plug our z-score into the revised z formula and find out that a 15th percentile corresponds with a height of 1.24 meters. Woo! That's how you use the z-table. And it's important that we get used to it because finding these tail areas is what finding p-values is all about, which is encompassed in all of our statistical tests that we're going to be learning as we go forward. So again, foundation building block of looking at normal curves and finding areas based on z-scores and moving back and forth with the table to convert and this formula z equals and x equals here on this slide. So I'm going to cut off this recording. It's gone over a half hour. I will try to make the other one definitely shorter.